darkness, humidity, more darkness. You have been wandering the caves for days now, searching for the legendary hammer of Lambda, and you found nothing so far. You enter a large room of typical dwarven architecture. In the distance, beyond rows and rows of pillars, a bonfire flickers, illuminating a tall archway and the silhouette of a creature that appears to be standing guard. What do you do? What do you do? That's really the question, isn't it? Like you could go take your bow and shoot an arrow at the creature. You could try to sneak in. Maybe you could try to talk to the creature. You could just go away, shoot a fireball. It's always a good, uh, good choice. So there are many, many things you could do. And so the small snippet I played here is for me what is the, uh, es contains the two essential elements of role-playing games or RPGs. Role-playing games are about two things. Like the first side is like uh, it's about an epic story. It's an adventure. It's full of, uh, it's, uh, full of dragons. It's full of dwarves. It's full of adventure. So this is, the first side is like you want a big story, like movie style, Lord of the Rings style. The second si side of it is like uh, in most cases when you have an epic story, you don't get to decide anything. Like you watch the movie and it's like it doesn't matter what you want. It's like somebody decided what will happen to the hero and this is what you will see. That's kind of sad. It would be nice to be able to try like this is what I want to do. And so this is what RPGs are about. Is like it gives you the choice of deciding what you want to do in that particular story and how it unfolds. So at that point, you might be wondering, this is great, but like uh, this is the NDC conference, and D is standing for developers and not Dungeons and Dragons. Why the hell uh, are we talking about Dungeons and Dragons here? For that matter, you might also be asking, like, who is this person here? So I'm going to start by introducing myself. My name is Matthias Brandevender. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, all these places. Usually people know me because uh, I speak about F Sharp and machine learning. So D&D is a bit off uh, my typical path. But the reason I wanted to talk about this is the following. Is like, so when I was a teenager, a long time ago, uh, I was really excited about D&D. And so I bought the books, I learned the rules, I knew everything there was to know about it at the time. And I never got to play a game, which is really, really sad. And so it's one of the things where I thought, okay, this is great. Now it's like uh, uh, maybe it's one of these things where you, uh, you just uh, accept that it will never happen in your life and uh, you just let go. And then last year, a friend of mine uh, suggested we should play D&D. And so I thought this is a great idea. And so since then, I've been uh, playing like for uh, over a year. I have been DMing a campaign. It's been a lot of fun. So, uh, so that's part of why I wanted to talk about it. And the other thing is like as I was starting to DM is I had to learn the rules again. Uh, to, uh, to uh, prepare the games and all of that. And so uh, being a software engineer, I thought it's like, what better way to make sure that I know the rules than to encode them uh, in code? So I uh, started with this project of like, take the uh, rules of Dungeons and Dragons and start to uh, write the code which corresponds to it. If I can do that, it means I understand the rules. Uh, it was uh, more complicated than uh, expected, spoiler alert. But it's been a lot of fun, and like, as I did this, like, I noticed that I was using a lot of the same techniques I was using just in, a, in a regular business applications. And so I thought, it's like, why not uh, share with other people like, the type of thing you've been doing, some of the tricks from uh, domain modeling. And so this is what I'm going to uh, be doing today, sharing a bit like how D&D uh, &D, uh, and F-Sharp modeling work together and what you might learn from it. So, uh, so uh, I will be your DM today, and our campaign will have like four uh, chapters. One is like I will start with uh, what is D and D. Uh, so uh, I'm I'm going to make a wild guess and suspect that a good half of the room knows D and D already. Like uh, I discovered, like there is a very big intersection between developers and uh, role-playing games. But like just in case, I'm going to talk a bit about what D and D is. Then I'm going to take the problem of like take a monster, a good old D and D monster, and model it with F Sharp. Then uh, I'm going to take a specific problem. Uh, the quintessential uh, element of D&D is the roll 20, like the, the dice. And so we're going to look together at how you could model that, because it's uh, specifically interesting. And then I'm going to show you like, my pride and joy, my D&D uh, &D combat simulator, which is uh, uh, so uh, that's what we're going to end up with. So let's start with uh, talking about D&D &D and the rules of D&D. So uh, I talked earlier about the fact that this was about you making decisions. So uh, in essence, Role-playing games are about agency. They are about like giving an actor, you, the ability to give, uh, to take actions in a particular environment. 
So uh, this is what games are about in general. To make a game interesting, you probably need two things. Like the first one is like you need to have consequences to your action. If like whatever you do, nothing happens, this is not a very interesting game. So uh, you need decisions and you need consequences. And if you want the game to be interesting too, you need some form, some form of regularity or some form of understanding of what is happening when you take decisions. Like they cannot be completely random. If you do things and you have random results, it's a roulette, like it's not particularly interesting. If you can predict things, you can start to think about is this a smart move, a bad move, you can start to be proud about the decisions you took. So this is what makes a game interesting. And for this, you need rules. So uh, there are a lot of uh, role-playing uh, games with different rules. Dungeons and Dragons is the oldest one. Uh, it was first published in 1974. I was kind of surprised to see how old the game was, uh, was actually. Has, going, has been going through many, many iterations. So I'm going to be talking about the D&D 5th edition, which is like the uh, uh, current standard. Uh, just like software, like uh, version uh, numbers are kind of a mess uh, in D&D as well. So I think there are actually 11 different versions, even though the current version is 5. Uh, it was the first role-playing game which was uh, published and named as such, and the universe is mostly Tolkien-inspired. So somebody actually corrected me on the internet because that's what you do on the internet and he told me this is not right. It's actually inspired by Conan the Barbarian. So if you, uh, if you want to nitpick, it's actually the Tolkien but Conan the Barbarian. But uh, still, same idea. If you want to play, the core rules uh, are the uh, player's handbook or PHB. So the PHB is like 360 pages long. That's uh, like a big uh, um, uh, book of rules. Uh, if you want to just, if you have never played before and want to try to play, there is actually a set of basic rules, uh, free online, 180 pages. Uh, so the, the smallest possible set of rules you would need to have to play is uh, close to 200 pages. That's, uh, that's, not, uh, that's already a bit big. As it turns out, if you're, if you're kind of serious about it, you probably need three books to really be able to play. You need the PHB, so 300 pages. You need the DMG, the Dungeon Master Guide, all for 300 pages. And you need the Monster's Manual, also 100, uh, 350 pages or so. So now is that we're starting to talk about uh, something like uh, 1,000 pages of rules. So this is where uh, I've been on this project of doing D&D. &D. I thought initially it would take me like maybe a couple of weekends. I've been on it for like six months. In hindsight, is like maybe the fact that my spec is like over 1,000 pages might have something to do with it. Like uh, it was uh, perhaps like less easy than what I thought. Uh, so when you play D&D, &D, uh, there are like two roles, or like any uh, role-playing, not every uh, role-playing game actually. For D&D, &D, you have two roles. One of them is like the players, uh, and the other one is the dungeon master. So the players are like, uh, they are there to have fun, to have an adventure. So they are in the story and they make decisions. The dungeon master is the one who's kind of uh, running the world. Like uh, if, uh, if you want to make decisions, somebody needs to tell you what you see. Somebody needs to decide what happens when you take the decision. This is the job of the DM. So it's like the DM uh, describes the situation. You take a decision and the DM will resolve what happens to your decision. Also, when you play the game, there are uh, two slightly different phases. Uh, so uh, one phase I would call like role play. It's pretty flexible. You use the rules, but uh, the focus is more interactions. You're talking to a dwarf, you're negotiating with other characters, like uh, you're doing all sorts of things. Rules matter, but like uh, it's pretty free flow. Uh, on the other hand, D&D uh, &D being uh, inspired by Tolkien is like you have plenty of, uh, of combat, like uh, essentially you have combat like uh, a bit all the time. And whenever you enter combat, is like things start to uh, follow a very rigid system. It's inspired by a war game. Uh, initially, the war game was actually called Chainmail. And so like, when you have combat, it's like, uh, you have like, turns. On a turn, you can do specific actions. A turn is six seconds, and you can do this and that and that. So this is pretty, uh, pretty rigid. Uh, when I was starting to model the rules, it's like, uh, I focused on the second aspect. In a way, this is not surprising. The part which is the most interesting to me as a player and as a DM is the role-playing part. That's the fun part. It's about telling stories and all of that. The second part is much more mechanical, but as a software engineer, like this is also usually what you do. You take the boring bits and the bits you can automate, and so this is my focus was mostly on the uh, combat part, because like building code to uh, tell stories and all of this would probably be uh, it would be a fun project, but it would be an insane project, and I don't think I can do that. So my focus was can we do things around combat? So let's look now at domain modeling, uh, the D&D model with F# -sharp. So as I said, is like we want uh, we are in a in a universe, and like we, uh, we want to be in a place where when we take decisions, we kind of have an idea of what is going to happen. To do that, is like we need to provide information uh, to the players. 
So imagine for a minute that uh, you are now in a dark corridor and uh, you find like one of these two creatures. They are clearly very different. Like the one on the left is a goblin. They are small, they are mean, they are fast. Uh, they are, that's, a, that's a goblin, uh, not very strong, like maybe four feet high. Uh, the thing on the right is like an ogre. So an ogre is like uh, eight feet tall, uh, big, uh, like dumb as bricks, but like uh, extremely strong. So these two things are quite different. So to be able to uh, have a game uh, with my players, I need to have a way to describe these two things and how they are different, right? So let's do that. The uh, canonical uh, representation for a monster is what's called the stats block. So every monster, every creature has a little document which represents essentially everything you need to know to be able to play that creature. And uh, so we're going to take a couple of, uh, uh, we're going to start div diving into the, uh, the stats block for a goblin. So to represent a creature, D&D uh, uses abilities. So player handbook, uh, page 173, six abilities provide a quick description of every creature's physical and mental uh, characteristics. Strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. So this is, a, this is like how you represent a monster, is like you have like these, these things. Uh, what I'm saying, so the way I would represent this uh, in F-Shop would be by using what's called a discriminated, discriminated union. So what I'm really saying here is like an ability can be one of six things, and it must be one of these things. Ability can be either strength, or dexterity, or constitution, and wisdom and charisma. So straight up, straightforward, like a problem solved. Now that we have the abilities, how do we use this? So abilities, player handbook, page 173, each of a creature's ability has a score, a number that defines the magnitude of that ability. So now what I'm saying here is that for a creature, I will have a score for each of the things. So here, to model this, I'm going to use what's called a record, uh, which is like similar to a class. So here I'm going to say uh, uh, I have scores, and a properly formed creature will have one of, the, one of each. So we'll have a score for strength, a score for dex, a score for con, and so on and so forth. All of them are here in one place. How do I work with this? Uh, we typically work using uh, what's called pattern matching. So if I wanted, for instance, to get uh, the dexterity score for a creature, what I would do is I would uh, write a function score. It needs two things. It needs the scores, like what are the six possible things, and what are you asking about, like what ability are you asking about. And so the function will uh, match and will say, fine, you give me an ability. That ability can be one of six things. If it's strength, I'm going to retrieve uh, the strength from the score. If it's dex, I'm going to do this. If it's constitution, I'm going to do that, and so on and so forth. So pattern matching is about, like, you give me uh, an ability. This has like a known shape with six cases. For each of the cases, I'm going to look at it, and depending on the case, I'm going to decide what I do. No, so far, so good. Uh, modifiers. Each ability also has a modifier. To det determine the modifier, subtract 10 from the ability score and divide the total by two, rounded down. So this is again from the PHB, I forgot the page, doesn't matter. But like this would be straightforward to do. I would write a function again. And so my function here would be great. Like uh, I have a function which is a modifier. What does it take? A score, and it's score minus 10 divided by two. Done, uh, move on, like uh, we are uh, in business. Uh, so at that point, one thing I could do is I could essentially model my creatures. I could say, uh, create a goblin. A goblin has a strength of eight, a dexterity of 14, and so on and so forth. I could write, uh, I could ask for the dexterity modifier for the goblin by uh, writing uh, my code this way, so which would be kind of uh, the classic way to write code. I would say I want the score of the goblin by uh, the dexterity, and I want to take that and plug it into the modifier function. So this is kind of a bit, uh, I have things and things and things, it's kind of difficult to follow. So one idiom you see a lot in uh, F-sharp is uh, the pipe forward. Uh, pipe forward says like take a thing, push it to the next function and get the result, push it to the next function and get the result. So instead of like going inside out, what I could do is I could say give me a goblin. For that goblin, I want to take the dex score and take that score and push it into the modifier function. And so the two things are completely equivalent, except that now I'm seeing like uh, take the goblin, do this to it, do this to it, uh, until the moment I have what I want. So now comes the moment to use like big words, like a uh, role for intimidation. What I showed you so far is like what's called uh, beyond F sharp, like in uh, statically typed uh, languages. Uh, it's called like algebraic data types. So algebraic data types are, uh, a quote Wikipedia, a kind of composite type formed by combining other types. So this is a not particularly enlightening uh, definition. Like it's one of these things where it might be true, but it's not very helpful. Uh, one way uh, I find it, uh, I find, uh, so one way I find useful in thinking about algebraic data types 
is algebraic data types are really uh, two big types. You have OR types and AND types. So the first thing we saw is that uh, we saw, uh, we saw uh, discriminated unions. A discriminated union was a case where, uh, where the case where we had this is like either dexterity or intelligence or strength or all of this. So, a, so uh, uh, um, an OR type is a type which describes a situation where I'm talking about something which can be this or this or this or this. That's the discriminated union. The second type of algebra, and that's called also a sum type because like all the cases, if you sum them together, describes all the possible uh, situations. The second uh, thing you can have is like what's called the product type. So they describe like an and relationship, like uh, the scores of a creature are intelligence and wisdom and uh, constitution. Uh, so all these things together, whenever you have an and statement, you're probably talking about a record. And when you have an or statement, you probably have a discriminated union. So this is like uh, what's behind the pompous name of algebraic data types. And so at that point, it's like you're ready to level up. You know algebraic data types, and we can embark to chapter two of our adventures. So let's move to, uh, to the next step here. So I'm going to revisit uh, the uh, stats block and start to dive in a bit into the section at the bottom called actions, which is describing what the goblin can do or like what creatures can do. And that's typically uh, focused a lot on combat and uh, attacks. Uh, so I'm going to skip that. And so if I look in detail at uh, the uh, section at the bottom of the stats block, what I'm going to see is this. Uh, Goblin has like two attacks. The first attack is a scimitar attack, so that's like a, a sword. Uh, it's a melee weapon attack. Uh, when you hit, you get a bonus of plus four, reach of five feet, one target. You inflict like 1d6 plus two damage when you hit, and that's damage which is slashing. Short bow is ranged, so also a bonus to hit. Uh, different range, one target, uh, certain bonus when you hit, and a different type of damage. So if I look at these two things, uh, I would argue that there is an obvious parallelism between these two lines. Right? That both of them have a pretty similar structure overall. And if I put them uh, side by side uh, uh, on a piece of paper, what I'm going to see is like uh, I have a name, like scimitar or short bow. I have like a melee or ranged uh, attack. I have like a, plus a bonus to hit, all these things. So they have a very common structure. So this is a strong uh, smell for me that uh, we will want to use a record because like what I'm saying is like an attack has this and this and this and this or this and this and this and this and this. So it looks like they have the same structure. So we're probably after a record. If I start diving a bit uh, deeper, is like even though the overall structure is the same, I also have like differences. Like uh, for instance, the second row has like a, a weapon attack, but the first one is a melee weapon attack, and the second one is a ranged weapon attack. The way I would read this is like uh, I have like two types of attack. It can be either melee or ranged. Like that's a strong hint that uh, an or statement is probably a discriminated union. I have a reach which is five feet, or like a reach which is 80 or 320. So it's like this or that again or have slashing or piercing. So these are like strong hints that I will probably want to use discriminated unions. So let's look at the specific case of melee and ranged attacks. Uh, player handbook, every weapon is classified as either melee or ranged. A melee weapon is used to attack a target within five feet of you. A ranged weapon is used to attack a target at a distance. Whereas like or, so you can see like the or statement here. If you look at a uh, player handbook again, like a range, a, a weapon that can be used to make a ranged attack has a range in parentheses. The range is two numbers. First one is like the normal range, and the second one is the long range, like uh, what's a normal thing and what's a long, long shot. Good. So if I look at this, like uh, this means uh, I could start to sketch out my model for an attack. And uh, the way I would uh, probably represent it is like overall, I have a record, which is of type attack, has a description, probably a string. I have something like melee and range. I don't quite know how to call it. Maybe it's the type of the attack. Uh, I have a hit bonus and I have a reach and the reach can be either five feet or like 80 feet uh, or 320 for something which is an, uh, a ranged weapon. How do I handle this? As it turns out, so I want to, uh, uh, now I can show you like another feature of discriminated unions is like discriminated unions can uh, work just as the labels, like uh, describing different cases, but what I can do to them is I can also attach data to each of the branches. So now what I can say is like really when I have an attack, the attack can have like two types of reach. One of them is a melee reach. If it's a melee reach, the distance, I will have like only one number, which is how far I can reach. When it's a ranged attack, I need two numbers. And so I'm going to tack in like the short range and the long range here. And so now I can say like my attack will have a reach, which could be one of these two things, which will contain exactly the right 
uh, exactly the data I need to represent each of the cases. So this is good. The way I would work with this is, that, again, by using pattern matching. So if I wanted, for instance, to know how far can I hit with a particular weapon, I would say, if you give me an attack, I'm going to look at the reach of that attack here, so I'm going to uh, match. If it's a melee, I know I have one number, and I'm going to give you that number, because that's the only thing you need. And if it's a ranged attack, I have a short range, a long range, I'm just going to give you the long one. So I can represent different structures, and I can use pattern matching to uh, branch on each of the cases and extract out the piece of data I care about for each of the situations. Easy peasy. Uh, now, is like, uh, here, what I used was a tuple, like I'm just putting two integers, like this is a bit primitive, so I could actually keep nesting a bit, and I could say a range reach is going to have like a short and a long value, like I'm going to put them both together, uh, which is much more explicit, because otherwise, if I have just two ins together, how do I know what they represent? So I'm going to say like a ranged reach has a short and a long reach, and now I could say like a, ranged, a reach has a, the case range, which is going to contain this thing, and when I pattern match, I'm going to say like uh, when you get a reach, if it's a ranged reach, just do reach.long, much clearer, all nice, all good. So it's kind of interesting too, because now you see that we're starting to nest, uh, we have a record with a distributed union, with a record with, so it's like there's this composition pattern where you keep nesting dolls like this. Uh, if I wanted to, I could be a bit fancier and I could use a module to make it a bit nicer, but like that's not particularly important, so I'm going to pass that. And so uh, at that point, is like what we have is like, uh, this is great, is like we just used records and discriminated unions, and we can represent like all the attacks we wanted to represent. Uh, we can represent the goblins, we can represent all sorts of creatures, we can represent all the situations we want to represent. The problem we have is that we can also represent situations which we do not want to represent. So here uh, is a picture of a chimera. Like a chimera is a combination of monsters together, like a, a lion and a goat and whatever this thing is. Uh, and so this is a combination which, is like, uh, which should not exist, like it's a monster. And this is what we have now with uh, our model. Because the, the problem we have is that like, uh, I defined in my attack that uh, I have uh, two types of attacks, melee or ranged. And I have also like uh, two types of uh, reach. I have like uh, a, a ranged reach and a, and a melee reach. And the problem here now is like I can create a monster or an attack which will have type melee, that's perfectly valid, uh, but which can also have a reach of a ranged reach. And that makes no sense. Like uh, if I have a, a sword, it's, uh, it should be one or the other. I should, not be, I should not have this combination. It should not even be possible. So we could deal with it, like one way to deal, to deal with it would be like to, uh, to have an exception, to put validation everywhere. But in general, uh, in general, like there is a bit of a mantra on the, uh, on the uh, f -sharp community, which is if you can, you should try to make impossible states unrepresentable. Like uh, one way of dealing with problems that you have a problem, uh, you, uh, you, uh, you maybe you, uh, you put validation around it. The other one is like if it's not even possible to uh, write uh, the bad situation in the first place, then uh, it spares you a lot of problems. So can we do that? Like in general, like uh, that type of problem, you will find when you have like pattern matches and you start to have like uh, uh, try catch blocks or like exceptions is an indication that probably your model is not quite right and you need to fix something. So what will be the fix in this case? Well. The fix in this case is not very complicated. It's like it's really to realize that uh, uh, I don't need all the information I have. Like what I had is like I had a type of attack which was melee or, or ranged, and I had a reach which was also melee or, or ranged. As it turns out, like if I, t if I tell you that the reach of the weapon is a ranged reach, it's like I'm also telling you right now that it's a ranged weapon. And if I told you that uh, it's a melee range of five, it's like you know damn well that the type of the attack is a melee one. So it's like I can actually remove that field, which is not necessary. And now it's like my monster is gone. It's like I can only create properly structured like ranged attacks or properly structured melee attacks. So I'm happy and I can move on with my life. So this is kind of what I did for the first like uh, weeks on this project. I was going through the, through the, uh, the, uh, the books and like modeling more and more and more. And I wanted to share maybe a couple of things I found, uh, like traps uh, I encountered, which are in general useful in domain modeling or type of things you might want to ask yourself when you're going down that path. So uh, my, uh, again, like I was young and naive back then. And like my thought was like, unlike most projects, uh, the, uh, in most software projects, like uh, one problem is like you don't have a proper documentation. I cannot, uh, that's not a claim I can make, is like it's pretty well documented. If I give you the rules, you can play in two hours. So I cannot use that excuse. So I thought if it's well documented, it should be pretty easy to implement. Uh, spoiler alert, it isn't. Uh, so, and uh, really like that applies beyond Dungeons and Dragons, but like the thing is, uh, documentation is full of uh, lies or maybe half truth. So like beware, or like there are a lot of things which, uh, yeah, like so first one is like uh, uh, if I look back, 
uh, what I used to model attacks was I started with this and took this as a prototype for this is a, how an attack typically looks like. So now uh, let me show you a couple of ways this is actually not right. So uh, if you go to the monster manual, you're going to find, for instance, a creature called a wyvern. So a wyvern is like a small species of a dragon. Uh, it's like a weaker version of a dragon. And uh, it can do a bunch of things. One of the things it can do is it, it can attack with its tail and do a stinger attack. And so that's an attack. And if you look at this, this is clearly very different from the, the case I showed with the goblin before. Like the wyvern can make a stinger attack. Uh, it's a melee, plus seven to hit, 10 feet reach, uh, blah, blah, blah. So, but this is like a much bigger. So how is this different from the previous one? Well, the first one is like uh, there is a flat out uh, lie in the rules. Like the rules say like a melee attack should be five feet. Guess what, is like here, like straight in the rules, I'm seeing like a melee attack uh, of 10 feet. So the, the point here is like uh, when people tell you it's true uh, in documentation, usually what they mean is like it's usually true. Like you never believe somebody who tells you like this is a true statement. Uh, so first, so a flat out line. Second one, like we have a difference here is like uh, uh, on the goblin is like what we had is like we had like one type of damage. The attack was either piercing or slashing or something. Here I see an attack which actually has like a multiple types of damage. It can, uh, it will pierce you and it, it will inflict uh, poison damage on you. So uh, where we had a field, uh, my initial thinking was that we have like one damage. And the question here is like when you see a field like that, is it one or is it at least one? And so it's not very difficult to fix. Like to fix the model here is like all I have to do is I have to say uh, I'm going to create a damage type like uh, with uh, maybe piercing, poison, whatever. And my attack, instead of being just one damage, is going to be a list of damage. Not particularly complicated, but you can do it. Actually, I had also uh, a friend who pointed out like uh, this is uh, true, but uh, now you're creating an impossible case because I could create an attack with a, an empty list of damage, which is also probably not right. So uh, you uh, might want to fix that, but like, uh, it's uh, good enough for now, like you get the idea. Uh, the other one is like one or maybe one. So here, uh, uh, the, the first part of the attack, like the, uh, the piercing damage is pretty straightforward, but here I see for the second case is like, the target must make a DC 15 constitution saving throw and uh, do this on a fail save, do a half damage on a successful save and so on and so forth. So this is a case where this is the first time we see it and it looks like it's, uh, most of the times you don't have this, but sometimes you will have like a lot of additional information uh, attached to your field. So that's not very difficult to fix either. Like typically what you will do is you will use a, what's called an option type. And so what I would do here is like in my damage, I would say like you have a type of damage, you have a dice roll, and you will have some special stuff. Like I didn't give it a better name. I'll leave that to you if you want to do it. Where I'm going to say like optionally, I'm going to give you a lot more information on the things you could do. Uh, other things could happen. They are not there by default, but they could be there. Another case I found interesting was this. So if you look at the rules, there is a big catalog of weapons, and uh, you will see things about weapons, like some weapons can be heavy. So a heavy weapon is like uh, heavy, uh, like, uh, and uh, you have also light weapons, which are like small and easy to handle. So if I look at this, I might think like this is great, like a completely obvious case for a discounted union. I'm going to create a type called weight, which is either light or heavy, and now my weapon has a weight which could be one or the other. Looks good, like uh, proud of myself, I'm using uh, all my uh, domain modeling techniques. And as it turn turns out, it doesn't quite work, because if you do this, uh, so you're going to realize like the problem here is like some weapons are heavy, some weapons are light, and some weapons are none of, none of these things. And so now that's a bit of a problem. It's like whenever you use a discriminated union, the, it should be the truth, all the truth, and nothing but the truth. Or stated uh, differently is like every case you could encounter should be covered in the discriminated union. And we don't have this here with a, with a light or heavy case. Because uh, now I need to represent cases which are neither light nor heavy. So the, you could go two ways about this. One of them, uh, and both of them are kind of correct. They're just like, uh, yeah, let's talk about how they're different. So the first case we to say, fine, is like what I'm really saying is like uh, a weapon can have no property or sometimes it will have a property and that can either be light or heavy. So the way I would uh, do this is by saying uh, use a, an option. So e either I don't have that property or if I have it, I have a, one of the two light or heavy. Or I could, the second situation is I could create just a fake case, which doesn't exist in the rules, which is called medium, and I would say light, medium, and heavy. 
uh, both of them are correct and wrong in different ways. So the, the second one is the easiest one to use. Like it's just flat, you can see exactly what's going on. The one thing I don't like about that is that the rules don't talk about uh, medium weapons. Like that doesn't exist. So I'm recreating a case for convenience. It's more practical to use, but it's not really present in my domain. I don't like that in general. I like my domain to stick to, uh, like the code should look like the, uh, the domain. The second one here is like more correct because it's really saying either it's present or not present. And if it's present, it's this way or that way. So that works. Uh, the problem with this, it's actually, a, a dar this one is a proper representation of the rules. It's just a bit more unpleasant to work with because now if I want to know about the, the, the weight of a weapon, I will have to say like, does this have a one? Yes or no? If it does, which one is it? So I need to start to dig into the object and it's a bit uh, more annoying. The last question you want to ask yourself, uh, I didn't really have that problem that much in this case, but uh, the last question you want to ask yourself on modeling with uh, records and discriminated unions is like, is the thing I'm looking at really closed? For instance, like uh, if you take the rules, you will see like there is a long list of like official weapons which exist in the rules. And so one thing you could say like maybe uh, like let's have a list, uh, a DU in the first case is going to be a short bow, long bow, blah, 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 and put them all in a discriminated union. That might work. Like the problem with this is like a discriminated union by construction and by design is closed. Like uh, the, it's the beauty of it and it's also uh, the limit of it, right? It's like, uh, the problem here is like if somebody comes up with a new weapon which is not in the rules, like I want my fancy magical tri trident or like whatever, you will never be able to fit it in the discriminated union because it is closed and forever. So one question to ask whenever you think about using a discriminated union is like, uh, uh, do I want to extend this or is this possible for people to come up with new cases uh, over time? If that's the case, you don't want to use a discriminated union. Good, so uh, to uh, summarize this, questions to ask is like, uh, when you're modeling is like, uh, uh, do first like, uh, is it, uh, uh, first is like people are probably lying, like be suspicious. Second is like, uh, is it one or at least one? One or maybe one, is it really closed? And do I have all the cases covered in my DU? Like uh, keep that in mind that like uh, modeling will go much better. Uh, as a side note, is like one thing, uh, so one thing I really enjoyed about domain modeling with F sharp is like how straightforward it is. So uh, uh, when I was uh, young and innocent, it's like uh, I was doing a lot of uh, old modeling as well. And like one of the advice I got was that like you should always composition over inheritance. Like this is uh, the, uh, it's one of the big principles. And if you look at what I've been doing here, it's like I've been doing that all day long. Like there is no inheritance, none of it. It's like all I've been doing is like composing two types. Either it's a record or it's a, dis a discriminated union, and I keep uh, composing and nesting them together. This is really nice, and this is refreshingly simple, because essentially when I'm modeling, is like the question I'm asking, is, like, is this a record, is this a DU? And then keep going, and at some point you don't have anything to model. Like, yeah, so very straightforward approach to uh, modeling, and I like that. Good, so now let's talk about uh, dice rolls. So uh, we saw that a bit earlier. So if you've never, if you've seen a game of Dungeons and Dragons, like uh, notoriously people come up with all sorts of dice, like uh, it's, uh, it's an iconic part of uh, the game. And so we've seen it already like in the damage. Uh, the damage of a short bow attack is like 1d6 plus two. So what this means is like I would take a six sided dice, uh, throw it, uh, look at the result and add two to it. So this is how you use it. In general, dice are everywhere in the game. Uh, it's, uh, and it even has its own syntax, so it's like you have like D4, D6, D8, which are like four-sided, six-sided, and so on and so forth, up to 100-sided, and you have the syntax, so you would see all over in the rules things like uh, 5D10 plus 15 plus 2D4, which is like telling you like how you, and so what we want is like uh, we would want to be able to represent this in our domain and write like the, uh, this expression, uh, yeah, in our code. So how do we do this? What we want is something like uh, an attack is like a 1D20, Damage is 4d10 plus 2d6 plus 4. So uh, when I looked at this problem, is like uh, I. Uh, so there are a couple of people who have been inspiring me in F-Shop, and like in uh, my uh, F-Shop journeys, like uh, I encountered, I had the, the luck to encounter like uh, this character here, Thomas Petrachek, uh, who is a half health of uh, great intelligence. And like, uh, I really recommend like, uh, checking out his work in general, but like one pattern I noticed in what he was doing is like in lots of places, he would start to uh, build expressions in F sharp and then uh, use these expressions to do all sorts of things around it. And like I start to think maybe that's a pattern which I should be uh, using in this case. So, uh, so, uh, so how would that play out? Uh, I described like damage, for instance, is something like 4d10 plus 2d6 plus 4. If I look at this uh, in terms of expression, is like what I really want with the dice is like I want to be able to model arbitrarily complex expression. It should be as simple as two, 
as complicated as like adding up like uh, a lot of dice types. I want to be complicated, I want to be simple, I should be able to handle all of this. And if I look at this, uh, this thing in terms of expression, I can see uh, three things. The, so I see like I'm rolling a 10-sided dice four times, so I have like dice rolls. And like whenever I have a dice roll, it's like I, I need to tell you like how many sides and how many dice do you want to roll, fine? The second thing I see is like the four here, four is not a dice, it's a number. So I need something like to model values in my expressions. And uh, the way I can compose expressions together is by using addition. I can take uh, either a roll or a value and I can add as many as I want to combine them into a bigger expression. So uh, let's, try to, uh, let's try to do that. So I'm going to go now to uh, VS Code. Is, this, uh, is the font big enough in the back? Okay, so uh, let's go, and uh, my goal here will be to model something like 6d10 plus 4 plus 2d6. So first thing we need is like we need dice. So that's not going to be too difficult. I'm going to create a type dice, and here I'm going to use like uh, an old trick uh, in, uh, in F-sharp, which is like I'm going to uh, represent the dice as a discriminated union, and that discriminated union is going to have one case only, which is going to be called D. Okay, first like, let me reset my session, that's going to be better. Good, and so now what I can do is I can do something like D6. And if I do D6, like this is going to be a dice of D6. Or I could do D10, and this is a dice with 10 sides. So we have a model for dice, uh, not too complicated, like, uh, so uh, fine, like that's a, a small piece of our problem. Now the thing which is a bit more complicated is that we want to represent expressions around dice rolls. So uh, if it's rolls, like let's say like a type dice roll. And so that dice roll I'm going to model as a, as a discriminated union. And so my roll can be uh, one uh, of three things. It can be a roll of dice, it can be a value, or it can be an addition of these things together. So let's do that. If it's a roll, it's going to be a roll of. And so my roll is going to contain a couple of things. I need to know like how many dice are you rolling, that's an integer, and like uh, what dice you're rolling, so a dice. Good. So this uh, already looks like it's working, so I'm going to run this case and confirm that this works. So a dice roll, so what I should be able to do is I should be able to instantiate like roll uh, two uh, d4. And that's a dice roll, so it's like a progress, like I have a one piece of my expression built up. Uh, the second piece I need is I need to be able to uh, do things like a, a straight up value, so I'm going to call that a value of integer. So now what I should be able to do is I should be able to do also uh, value of let's say four. And if I run this, like this should be also a dice roll. So progress, now I have like two things in my expression. The thing I really need is I need the combination of them through addition, so I'm simply going to say great, if I need to combine them with addition, how about I add them? And an addition is going to be a list of a dice roll, because this is what I want. So I'm going to do a list of dice roll. Looks like uh, the compiler is happy so far. I'm going to run this. And so now is like what I should be able to do, I should be able to also to, uh, to do something like add, take a list, and I'm going to take these two guys here, and I'm going to put them in the addition. And uh, if I haven't messed up, like this should also, so first like uh, it's not complaining, so it should work. So if I run this, is like what I'm going to get, is I'm going to get a dice roll, which is the addition of 2d4, and a value of four. And like, uh, I'm not going to do it right now, but like, uh, you can see how, so now I can represent a role, I can represent a value, and I can represent an addition, and I can, uh, I can keep going. I can also say like, in there, I want you to uh, add uh, a value of four, of three, whatever, and like a role of like, uh, a role of like 10, d20. So, so now it's like, uh, essentially like, uh, Come at me with whatever a dice roll you want. Is like I can do it. Like I have a way to represent all of them. Like uh, so, this is good. So progress. Uh, so this is good, but this is not particularly elegant. It's like what I wanted is like uh, I wanted something which looked like this: six d10 plus four plus two d6. What I got is like something which functionally is the same thing, but like uh, visually looks uh, pretty heavyweight. So it's like uh, let's see now that we have a model which is correct. Can we actually take it and uh, refine it a bit to uh, get closer to what we want uh, to uh, the human syntax? So the first thing you can do, which is not very difficult, is I can say like let d4 equal d4. I'm simply going to name. Oops, I'm simply going to name like uh, all these cases. So I'm going to create a d4, a d6, a d8, and I'm going to go up to d10. I'm not going to do all of them because uh, it's going to be a bit lengthy. And so now what I should be able to do is like it's not a huge progress, but uh, what I should be able to do here is I should be able to, to do the following, is like uh, replace this by d4, 
and this by d10. So it's already a bit nicer, but like it's a marginally better. Like uh, it's no, it's a, not a huge improvement. What uh, what really uh, the uh, the bulk of uh, the uh, ugly stuff is uh, the addition. It's like uh, like uh, writing like add open brackets and all these rules is like uh, it's pretty unpleasant. So can we fix that? Well, certainly we can. So this is one uh, one thing which I didn't realize like uh, for a long long time is like I didn't realize that you could actually add uh, properties, methods, all these things to a discriminated union. So this is what I'm going to do here. Is like what I really want is I want to be able to add an operator to uh, things in my uh, in my expression. So let's do that. I'm going to do uh, a static uh, member. It's going to be plus. And so what I want is like I want to be able to add. Is this what I wanted to do? I think I'm forgetting one step here. Oh, this looks right. Okay. So uh, the uh, I can uh, I can add a plus. And so uh, what will a plus take is like it should take like two rolls. So I'm going to do roll one is a dice roll, and roll two is a dice roll. And so what I should be able to do with this is I should be able to say like whenever I see two dice rolls like this, is like what I want you to do is I want you to give me back add roll one and roll two. And so now let's try this. And so with this is like what I should be able to do is I should be able to take this ugly thing and I should be able to be able to do something like roll two d4 plus value of 10. And guess what? Like this is a valid role. So now it's like uh, we're getting like much closer to what we want, right? It's like uh, now we, we got from something which works and is ugly and we're getting to something which works and is going to be pretty. So this is better. Like the other thing which is uh, awful here is like the uh, value of 10. Like uh, value of 10 is ugly. What I would really want to write is this. I would want to write like a role uh, plus 10. Unfortunately, a 10 is not uh, a role, so it doesn't fit in the expression. So let's see if I can handle this. Like, well, that's not too hard. It's like uh, all I need to do is I need to uh, use the same trick here again. And so whenever, when we to do is like, uh, what I should be able to do is uh, when I, I'm adding two things together, is like uh, when I have a role in first position and an integer, like a value, which is going to be an int here, so I'm going to use a similar trick to what I had. And what I'm going to do here, I'm going to say simply like, when you see a number here, take that uh, and uh, wrap it up into a value and give, me, give that back to me. And so now it's like uh, we're taking this, like wrapping it up and give you back. Uh, so let's see how that works out. And now if I go back to my uh, example here, it's like, I mean, it's compiling. So now it's like uh, I can write like uh, 2d4 plus 10, and it's uh, constructing all the thing like nicely for me behind the scenes. And at that point, it's like, I would say like I'm awfully close to uh, the goal I wanted, right? It's like what I wanted was uh, uh, the only thing which is really missing is like uh, what I would want is like something like 2d4 plus 10. So uh, I will never be able to write like 2d4 that way because like uh, writing a literal starting with a number is not valid uh, in, uh, in .NET, I can't do it. The one thing I could do is I could do the following. I could do a two times d4 plus 10 and use the same type of trick and keep going. So I'm not going to do it here for the sake of time because like, uh, I think you get the idea of how we get there. But like, uh, I could again use something which is kind of a factory method to uh, take something and uh, transform it into the expression I want and keep going. So with this, is like I can uh, go all the way and write my dice rolls. And so I'm going to do the following. And the way I would use this then is like, uh, so uh, let me show you the full model. Once it's done, that would be this. So I would have dice. I have the dice rolls, and this is pretty much what I showed you. I have like a couple of uh, dice from uh, D4 to D10, and uh, I should be, and the piece which is, uh, the, piece which is uh, the way I would use it is like now I can uh, use it by uh, using an uh, interpreter. So now I have an expression, and I can take that expression and do whatever the hell I want with it. I can transform it in other things. I can use it, for instance, to compute the result of a dice roll. So if you give me a dice roll, either it's a value, uh, if it told me value of 10, the value is 10, if you give me a, a roll, then I'm going to uh, create, like, uh, say, five times the dice and uh, do a random, send them together. And if it's an addition, I'm just going to add them together. So now I can do something like this. I can say 4d10 plus 2d12 plus 2, pass it into the eval function. It's going to tell me 37 and 37 and 40, 36 and 46, 51. I do not know if it's right, but it's not blatantly wrong. So it's like uh, I will ask you to trust that the uh, interpreter is working. Cool. So let me go back to uh, my slides for a minute. 
So yeah, what we did here was we had a problem. We wanted to uh, model something which looks like expression. The first step we did is like we built a DSL by building like uh, something which was not pretty, but which was uh, faithfully representing uh, the, uh, the language we were trying to work with. And then out, uh, out of this, we built uh, an interpreter which was using that expression to do whatever I want with the expression. And so this is something I've been using all over the place in my code right now. Like, uh, the, uh, obviously, like, uh, dice rolls are very important, but I used it to uh, do things that give, uh, give my customers uh, a DSL where they can actually write code, which uh, write a, a text file which looks like, uh, like Excel, and then load it up into my expression and run that at runtime. I did that for other things like uh, pat uh, unexpectedly, you will see exactly the same pattern to model things like uh, web pages. Like uh, you can represent a web page as a, a series of elements which are combined in more elements. And so you can model your page like this, and then it's, like it's very easy to generate an HTML document or a markdown document. So you write interpreters to uh, do all sorts of transforms. So it's a super powerful pattern, uh, which I, I see uh, in more and more places. And uh, what we did was uh, we wrote first like something which was uh, correct, and then we used like uh, all sorts of small tricks to make uh, the language nicer. So a lot of it really revolved into uh, creating like helpers, which were constructors, like uh, to go from like uh, yeah, essentially like take the number and put it into the expression, or like uh, help people create the right uh, the right expression. Cool. So now I'm going to uh, close on this, and I'm going to move to uh, the uh, to a Fable Elmish and like my D&D uh, &D, uh, combat simulator. So really, uh, my initial goal was to model the rules, and it's like at some point. So one of the reasons I wanted to do that is like I had a very early on a problem with my game. It's like the first uh, the first game I played, and my players encountered a group of monsters, and I nearly killed everybody within like 30 minutes. And so this was not great. Like it's the first time everybody was playing Dungeons and Dragons. It's like you don't want to start your game by, by hearing like, "Hey, half an hour later, you're dead." Uh, this really. So it's like this. Uh, so I thought it's like I need to understand better. Like how do I know that the fight is uh, balanced, or like that? Uh, how do I know if uh, how much? What's the risk of me uh, total party killing uh, the, my players? So uh, and this is not completely obvious to do. So I wanted to uh, get to that problem. So to do that is like, uh, what I really mean is like, if my players don't do anything silly, like if you play like an idiot, it's like by all means, like uh, you should be punished. But uh, if you play right, if the monsters play reasonably well, it's like I would want to know what's the probability of uh, each of the sites to survive. So to do this is like, I need to build a simulation, or at least that's uh, how I thought about approaching it. Uh, like, uh, and uh, if I want to build a simulation, I could play the same fight uh, like a million times, and uh, this will give me a sense for like uh, how balanced the thing is. Now to do that, I need two things. One is like I need the rules, because like if I don't have the rules of the game, I cannot simulate it. So this is why like uh, I got into this whole project of uh, putting the rules together. And I need also an automated decision-making system for the uh, monsters, because uh, uh, if I run it a million times, I'm not going to play it by hand. So I need like uh, a way for a goblin and for a player to make decisions in that fictional fight. So uh, I need these two things. So this is uh, tricky. So let's look a bit at what I built. If you're in combat, you have turns, and on your turn, you can do a couple of things. You can move, and uh, I suppose you can move, and you can take one action. Uh, again, like there are lots of lies in this sentence, but I'll take that as a face value for now. In practice, what this means is like when it's my turn, is I, I can move, uh, and I have 20 feet speed. I could do something. I can move north, move west, decide to attack a goblin, move north again, and I still have some movement, but I can decide I'm done, finished. Like it's a uh, next person's turn. So this is how a turn looks like in combat. The way I would move it is like I would say like uh, really uh, uh, I can take two actions. I can move in a certain direction or I can attack a certain creature. It's a bit simplified, but it's overall correct. To know what happens when I take an action, I also need to know like where the goblin is, where I am, what type of thing I have. So I need a state. So I'm going to need something like a state, which is going to be what are the creatures I have and what's their state, what's the creature which is currently playing, like uh, who's playing in what order, and so on and so forth. And now is like all I need to model combat is to do something like this. I have my current state. I'm going to get a message which is going to be what creature is acting and what action they are taking, validate that uh, they actually can do it, and then uh, pattern match if the action is a move. Uh, move and update the state. Otherwise, if the attack is an attack, like uh, uh, perform the attack and update the state and so on and so forth. So what I'm really getting is like a model which is going to look like this. I'm going to, I can have a long list of commands, like uh, creature one moves, 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 blah, 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 uh, build this list, and I'm going to pass it to initial state, and at every state it's going to update the state up to the current state. If you've done things like event sourcing, this should be very familiar, like uh, event sourcing is like a super nice fit with a, a functional, uh, functional style. 
I'm going to skip on this. And so then I, I thought, like, this is cool, uh, can, uh, but like looking at what's happening in the combat, like in the console, is not the most uh, pleasant. So could I make something uh, visual with it? And could I actually see what's happening to my combat? Like, it would be nicer and also would, more, would be more fun. And at the time, like, there was a project which was uh, gaining a lot of traction called the Fable Elmish. So Fable Elmish uh, combines two things, like a uh, shocker, the first one is Fable, the second is Elmish. So Fable is like a transpiler or a compiler of F -sharp to JavaScript via Babel. So I can take F -sharp code and compile it to JavaScript. And Elmish is like an implementation on F -sharp of the Elm pattern, uh, like the model view update pattern, which looks like something like this. So the model view update pattern says that like, uh, uh, you have a model which represents uh, your state of the world. Uh, you're going to receive messages and like you have an update function and like every time a message comes it's going to update the model which is the state and so on and so forth and you have a view function which is going to look for uh, the model and just re-render the result like every time it's necessary like uh, and of course like you need to start somewhere so you also need an init function which is going to tell you like this is how I start and so that works really nicely because here I need, just need to give you like uh, what's the initial model what are the actions like my uh, my, uh, my uh, monsters and the players perform and uh, let's uh, let that update so let me show you like my pride and joy, uh, the uh, the uh, D&D uh, simulator. So this is, uh, I'm not a web developer, I'm not a game developer, so it's like arguably what I'm going to show you here is the ugliest uh, web application you've ever seen. Let me first start it. So this is my project, it's all F-sharp. Just going to start it. So when I start it, what it's going to do is going to, uh, to, uh, to start things up. It's going to, uh, now it's going to pass my F-sharp project. Right now it's compiling the whole thing. And like within a couple of seconds, is like what I should have is I should have like uh, uh, this this thing. So let me go here, and I'm going to go to localhost. Maybe I have oversold it. But, uh. So this is it. Like this is a, a, a. I'm sure it's going to be a, a smash hit on like uh, Steam. Uh, what uh, what you see here is like uh, so. The, uh, what uh, you see here is like a field. Uh, with like a couple of creatures, so the blue ones are like wolves, the the orange ones are like goblins, and here I, I'm presenting like uh, what uh, currently it's the turn of this goblin here, and I have all the actions uh, based on the rules. Like this is what the goblin can do. So I can, for instance, move north, move north, move north, move southwest, and I'm going to attack with a bow, and I'm going to finish my turn. This guy is going to move south, 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 uh, maybe attack, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, uh, so I'm showing you, like, right now, the most, probably the most boring way uh, and horrible way to play d and It's like no story, terrible UI, and all of this. But, like, the thing which is neat here is I like, can also switch to automated. And so at that point, is like, uh, now is like I'm letting uh, my, uh, my wolves and my goblins, like, uh, follow strategies. And now is like, uh, now we have a fight. So you can see uh, on the, uh, you see the comments which are taken. And on the, the right, there is a journal of, like, everything which is happening. I'm keeping an entire log of, like, the state machine of, like, this is, here I can see that the attack was attempted, that the attack was uh, successful, and so on and so forth. First fight, uh, it looks like the goblins got completely reamed. I'm uh, going to uh, do another one. And so I can keep going like that and like, so start to play and uh, simulating different situations and see what's going on. From my experience, it's like, uh, I think it's also uh, because the engine I have for the goblins right now is pretty weak, but the goblins get uh, usually decimated by the wolves. Like, uh, yeah. So this is it. Like, this is a... Uh, uh, this is like my uh, my pride and joy. Is like uh, it's uh, the uh, D and D simulator, soon on Steam for your uh, for your pl uh, playing pleasure. Cool. So uh, what did I want to say about this? So yeah, like I talked about like uh, so this is what I built. Like uh, one thing is like uh, one thing which is uh, tricky here. So one half of the problem is like building the rules. The other one is like building like an automated decision making system because I, I need the goblins to decide by themselves. I need the wolves to decide by themselves. One problem I had was like uh, uh, before even deciding what a creature could do, is like uh, it's good. Uh, one thing which makes my life simpler is like if I know first what you can do, then I, I can decide what is it that you should do. Like uh, uh, I'm going to. Um, so uh, the idea here is like a creature at any time, like every movement is possible. If you have a, uh, a wall uh, north of you. Uh, I should not l even let you move north because then I will have to validate and all this. So validate all the, the impossible moves is a pain. So what I tried to do was uh, to build a model where I can actually, from the rules and from the situation, give a list of like these are the actions you can actually take. And that thing I uh, pulled from another legendary creature uh, from the, the, uh, from the uh, F-Sharp uh, Adventures, and that's called Lashen. 
Uh, so Scott is a GNOME droid with a very high wisdom, and like uh, I already had a really good talk like a couple of years back on like enterprise tic tac toe, and uh, so a very important topic. Like uh, if you want tic tac toe, it has to be enterprisey. But uh, the one thing you talked about uh, in this was the idea of capability based uh, modeling, which is normally uh, done for uh, security, like where instead of like uh, letting people do all sorts of things and validating afterwards that they have the rights to do this uh, security wise, you just give people only the actions they can perform. This is great because now it's like you don't have to validate anything. And so I just wanted to uh, give a tip of the hat to Scott because I pulled that idea straight up from him and this is how my whole model is built. Uh, going to skip on this, this is fine. Yeah, but like the, in the end, like the uh, change in the architecture was uh, uh, on top of like my base uh, Elm model. What I have is like uh, I have an agent or a mailbox processor here and like wait, anytime there is an update, I'm sending like the whole state here uh, uh, for a decision. So now it's making a decision. That decision is actually going to emit a message and the message is going to plug back in the loop. So this is how the whole loop is uh, playing against itself uh, perpetually. The beauty here also is that this agent, I can plug in different strategies and see this one works better, works less. And so this is, uh, this is, uh, this is kind of uh, how my thing is built. Conclusion. First is like uh, I started thinking like this is going to be a couple of weekends. I've been on it for like five months now. Uh, and uh, there's still plenty missing. Like uh, I need to finish implementing the rules. It's like uh, I probably have still uh, 9,800 uh, something pages of rules to implement. Uh, specifically, there are a bunch of things I'm missing. It's like uh, uh, I'm missing magic, but like magic, I think is not very complicated. So uh, I mean, in the rules, magic is not very complicated. Uh, I need to model like uh, terrain, like things like can you see the creature, all these things. Uh, I'm not worried about it. Like it's going to be painful, but I uh, I kind of know how to do it. Uh, one thing I've been generally struggling with is like things like buffs and debuffs. Like uh, uh, for instance, a, a simple example is like if you look at a wolf. Uh, the rules say, uh, like, uh, if you're a wolf and uh, another wolf is attacking the same creature as you, you get an advantage. Representing that type of thing is a nightmare because, like, I don't know if it does it belong to the wolf? Is it uh, on the global state? How do I do all these things? So I've been like, uh, uh, that's harder than magic. Like, I've been uh, banging my head against the wall, and if any of you have uh, experience, like, uh, with game development or how to model that type of thing, I would be really interested in chatting because uh, it's. Uh, yeah, it's keeping me up at night. So anyways, like the, that's one side, so I keep uh, going at it, and it's like probably in five years, it's like, yeah, I will have something which is uh, almost done. Uh, the other thing which is missing is like so far, my uh, creatures uh, are using a strategy which is more or less like uh, hot-coded or like uh, done by hand. What I really want is like uh, I want to uh, end up in a place where I can plug in like some reinforcement learning. So the uh, reinforcement learning is a machine learning technique. Uh, this is the one which is used like in uh, AlphaGo and all these things. And uh, in, uh, in a nutshell, what it does is like uh, uh, play the game, let the game play itself over and over and over again. Do random things, like uh, try things, uh, good ones, bad ones, and like, then observe what happens. If some moves work better than others, do more of that. If some moves don't work in general, do less of it. And like uh, after a million times or a billion times if you're lucky, uh, the game will have learned like what are the good moves, the bad moves, and we'll do the right thing. So that's the theory, like the practice might be a bit different, but this is what I'm after. So I'm, uh, I'm hoping that in a couple of months I might have some reinforcement learning for my goblins. Like it's uh, the true beginning of Skynet, like uh, machine learning train uh, goblins. And this is what I had. And uh, yeah, otherwise one thing which has been like, uh, it's a bit of an open question, but uh, I've been generally puzzling on, uh, on this question is, uh, this thing is fully documented. The documentation is excellent. Like if I give you the rules, you should be able to play within a couple of hours. Why is it that with such a good documentation, it's so hard to uh, model things? And I, I think part of the, uh, so that's also something I'm interested uh, in talking about if you want after the, the talk. Uh, it looks to me that uh, there is a big difference between documentation for humans and specification. Like uh, the, uh, the documentation in general tends to omit, uh, the rules of documentation, they're meant for humans. So they tell you, Lots of things which are half truth, but which are helpful for you to form you, yourself a very quick uh, mental picture of like, this is what I'm trying to do. A specification is quite different because specification is all about the edge cases. Like it's, uh, it's about knowing all, uh, all the state around the decision itself. And so having good documentation is actually not very helpful in uh, having a good implementation. Uh, the, uh, so if you have uh, ideas or thoughts on documentation and specs, I'm also quite interested in talking about this. Anyways, so this is what I had. So I think on that note is like uh, I will uh, stop talking uh, and I will say thank you and I will cast bless because this is the proper way to finish like a D and D themed uh, talk. Uh, hope you have a great rest of the conference. Like if you want to follow me on Twitter, all these places, this is me. If you want to talk to me about D and D and other stuff, like uh, talk to me. 
And uh, the whole code is like uh, on GitHub, like uh, on the uh, Monster Vault project. So it's like uh, you'll see like all my commits, the good, the bad, the ugly. And uh, that's it. So thank you. I think I even have like one minute for questions if people have questions. Yep. Uh, what, what? Yep. In this case, yeah, so in this case, I'm going to roll a, a first dice and a second dice. Yeah, I'm doing it exactly the, uh, this is done right. Yeah. The one thing I'm missing is like I'm actually building up to do a crit. Uh, because I don't quite have that, and uh, critical rolls are kind of tricky, right? Because like the uh, normally a critical roll is like if you roll a twenty, then is like uh, you succeed no matter what. And so I haven't put it in the expression yet, but like I'm working on it. Yep. Yep. Yes. Uh, I can. That's the beauty also of a, uh, so I, I haven't needed to do that. Uh, so uh, you mean like if I look at the game, like uh, do, we, do I keep track of the roles which happened? Or like uh, do I? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, uh, so the, so the answer is like uh, I, uh, uh, the answer is like, uh, given what I implemented so far, I didn't have to, but like uh, the, uh, that's also the beauty of having an expression, right? It's like uh, I can keep like uh, the whole thing, and I, I could write an interpreter to do that and like keep only part of the interpretation, or like so this this won't be a problem to do. I didn't have to do it yet, but it shouldn't be an issue. Cool. Then uh, have a good uh, rest of the conference.